Hello and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. I'm Natasha Kirchuk here with our new weekend broadcast. You might not know it, but prostate cancer is the most common cancer among men. Now, one Israeli company has developed an incredible life-saving treatment for the disease, and it involves no radiation or chemotherapy. Two Israeli professors from the Weizmann Institute have created a photodynamic therapy that uses light to kill prostate cancer tumors in their early stages. The treatment takes only 90 minutes to complete, and it has minimal side effects. It's a photodynamic therapy. It's basically um, a procedure where we can target the cancer and we can uh, demolish it actually very very exactly it's something new that uh, we've been searching for ages uh, especially in prostate cancer where we know that many patients have focal disease and we didn't have focal therapy the treatment is currently being used in Israel in a pilot study of 50 patients MRI scans on patients who have undergone the procedure show that in the majority of the cases, prostate cancer tumors completely disappeared within two weeks of treatment. The patient may be cured. He may not be even cured of his disease, but he may have a remedy for 20, 30 years, which is exactly what we need. Most of these patients are men the age of 60, 70, not all of them healthy. And if you give them 10, 20 years with good health and without side effects, which is the main thing, then we've done a great thing and we've done a revolution. So how does the procedure work? First, doctor use an ultrasound device to insert conductors into the patient's body before carefully placing them near the blood vessels feeding into the tumor. Then they inject a drug called TUCAD into the patient's blood circulation for around 10 minutes. TUCAD makes any light toxic to living tissue so that when doctors light up the optic fibers within the patient's body, the cells touched by light immediately die. 51-year-old Yaron Svadia was diagnosed with prostate cancer two years ago, and he was too afraid to go into surgery to remove the tumor. When he was offered this really pain-free photodynamic therapy, he immediately decided to try it out. So one day after the treatment, I was back at home, and three days later, I was back at the office with regular life like before. And today, after the surgery, after I got the new MRI, I found out that my life is back again, and everything is, was like, like before, no side effect, sexual like like before, and I feel great. It looks like scientists may even be able to apply the amazing treatment to other cancers. Another breakthrough that this local treatment will allow us to find a solution to those uh, uh, cancers that are found at an early stage and currently are met with quite aggressive treatment methodologies which avoid patients that are found at that stage to utilize the full power of these methodologies. Lots of athletes immigrate to Israel from around the world to pursue their dreams in professional sports. One special athlete happens to be Tony Younger, and the American-born star has managed to lead his basketball team to victory at the Israeli National Championships. Congratulations on your big win with Rishon Lexian. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is a huge accomplishment. Can you take us through your winning season? How did this happen? Well, I think we all, you know, we ran into some tough times, and um, I think for the amount of games that we played, we just stayed strong, stayed together, came out some champions. Absolutely. Um, so we just persevered. And for you, this is a huge accomplishment for your personal absolutely, career. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, most people, you know, professional athletes or, you know, people wherever, they don't get an opportunity to uh, win a championship or a title or a medal, you know, so it's definitely something I couldn't foresee and I'm, I'm more, than, more than happy I achieved it. How did that feel, you know, immediately after? I always wonder, what are these athletes feeling when they're, after this big win, everybody's cheering? I don't know how, I, I was excited, but I, don't, I didn't know how to celebrate. I was just, it's just inside you that you just keep geeking. <laughs> um, but um, it's just amazing. It really is it's such a such a under uh, underused word, but um, you know, like like it's amazing. So you moved to Israel in two thousand two to play basketball. Tell us about that decision. Why did you make the decision to come here? Well, um, I saw opportunity first, and um, I had a friend of mine, Eric Campbell, who played out here, and Mickey Gorka also 
you know, got him situated out here. So I saw that it was possible. Um, upon taking the visit, um, I was, you know, I was, I admired this this area, um, the people, the food, and I was just immediately like in love with Israel. And then once I met my wife, it was over. Was it was here. over. That was, was it. You here. were staying here. Yeah. So in 2009, you made Aliyah, mm -hmm. and then you eventually converted to Judaism. What, I mean, you say that it's your wife, but really, what about Israel drove that decision? I don't know. I think the camaraderie of the, um, I would say the camaraderie of the country is something that you, you don't see often. Um, even the first groups of people that I met here are still, like, great friends of mine to this day, and I thank them for that. And I think it's just the closeness that the country has being that it goes through so much turmoil. And it makes it a, a lovable place. It really does. What's your absolute favorite thing about Israel? I know that's a hard question. Ooh, I would have to say uh, the weather. I would say the weather. Not that bad, not that bad in the wintertime. And, okay, summertime, and it's, 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 it's hot, but uh, it's... But coming okay. from New York, coming from Queens, coming this from is York, amazing. Yeah. The yeah. beach is right there, the environment. It's, a, it's so many things. Like, it can't be one thing. Yeah, it I know what you mean. No. So, you know, finally, for other young athletes from around the world who are considering coming to Israel to pursue their dreams in sports, mm -hmm. what do you say? What kind of advice would you give? Do you recommend it? I recommend uh, following your dream. That's number one. Whatever it is, um, ultimate confidence in yourself, and, but um, to come over here and to make a, to continue playing, whereas you might not have other opportunities in other countries, you should come to your home country and, uh, you know, make it happen. You know, you can, you can make history. You know, um, I think that uh, you should pursue anything that you, your heart desires. You should, really, you should really do that. What do you see your future to be like here? Where do you think, what is your next step? What are your goals, you know? <laughs> I've had so much of a past that I don't even know the future. Right, um, exactly. <laughs> I would say um, just teaching, teaching my children, you know, um, that's all that I really want to do in the end. Like everything is, is, is great that happens to you and, and your spouse, but in the end you want to have something to leave for your children. So I think that's my ultimate goal that I'm working towards every day in my life without knowing it directly or indirectly. Like that's, that's what you live for. So, um, you know, the next generation for them to be successful, you know, you know, healthy, without the shim, you know, like, you know. What was the process like to make Aliyah? I mean, I know you spoke about it a little bit, but this is something that not everybody goes through. Well, the process was, um, I would say it was, it was a tough process to have to jump over so many hurdles, but the people involved in that process made it a lot easier for me, you know. Um, whether it be free listening at a synagogue, studying with my rabbis at, a, at his house, um, you know, meeting, meeting another rabbi uh, for meetings, and then, you know, finally all the way up until the Bet Dean, and that was like a year after all that, and maybe even more. Um, but I studied, um, I think the study helped me, helped me with the history because what I had known up until then was everything that I saw that I was here, but I didn't know the, back, the background story, so I think that it all tied into one once I put the two and two together. You right, know you're I able mean? to really learn about the history so, of this country yeah, and why people are so passionate about being Kind of here. a roundabout way, but that's how it happened, and it, was able from, it made me complete like everything that I experienced without fully knowing. So that was, um, that was like the... Absolutely. Not the hard part, but the like... Complete Probably the most circle. important, yeah, yeah special no. part of this. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming in. It's thank amazing to me. see what you've done. Congratulations again, Thanks. and hopefully uh, we'll have you back and we'll see you on the court. Cool. As if Israeli music lovers aren't excited enough about Queen's upcoming performance in the Holy Land, now they have another major star to look forward to. The world-famous Beyonce is rumored to be coming to Tel Aviv to perform in October. Beyonce is the third highest grossing solo touring act in history, and she has a huge base of fans in Israel. If the star does show up in the country, she'll have two of her favorite clothing designers close by to work on her outfits. For her two last world tours, the pop diva wore dresses created by the Israeli designers In Baldror and Alon Livne. This isn't the first time that local Israeli newspapers are reporting that Beyonce may come to Israel. Back in February, there were rumors about two Beyonce shows this summer. 
but they were never booked. Now the rumors have gotten serious, and if Beyonce actually comes, it will be her first time performing in the Holy Land. Yesterday we learned about how the lack of communication between the United States and Russia could have a devastating impact. By creating conditions similar to those that brought the world to the brink of nuclear disaster during the Cold War. ILTV's Steve Leewitt sat down with former U.S. Secretary of Defense William Perry to find out why the lack of communication between the world's nuclear superpowers is a recipe for catastrophe. An accidental nuclear war could start because either side falsely detected an attack coming against it. And then they had to decide what to do with their ICBMs. And they might decide to launch them on the base of that information rather than lose them. And then if the information were wrong, they would have accidentally started a nuclear war. The, we have had, during the Cold War, at least five different false alarms. Each time we made the right decision not to launch both the United States and Russia. But it does depend, those correct decisions were because there was no specific tension, no specific issues at the time. Had, they, had those false alarms happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, that would have created a context in which we might have made the wrong decision. So my point simply was, as relations hostility between the United States and Russia increases, it is recreating the conditions which might allow us to make a wrong decision might allow us to put the pressure on the leaders to decide to launch rather than wait and see. Accidents will happen. Uh, we will have false alarms again in the future. It's important that when those false alarms occur, our leaders can believe that they were false and not that the other side is deliberately launching an attack against us. So those are the conditions I'm concerned about, recreating the conditions of hostility, which might increase the possibility of an accidental nuclear war. Wouldn't know we're from Israel. I'd like to ask you a question that um, certainly is on the minds of Israeli viewers. Um, we are have a policy of nuclear ambiguity. We've never the state of Israel has never admitted to nuclear. Has the time come for Israel to join the nuclear non-proliferation treaty? I believe yes. First of all, the ambiguity is not convincing. And uh, secondly, we need all the help we can get in the Non-Proliferation Treaty. It would be helpful to have Israel's weight in there helping us because of besides the next to war, the second great danger is uh, more proliferation of nuclear weapons, and we end up with a regional nuclear war. So it's very important, I think, uh, to have the support of Israel in the Non-Proliferation Treaty. But to do that, Israel has to back away from its position of Amb ambigu ambiguity in nuclear weapons. In Israel, we were, of course, lobbying against the, the nuclear deal with Iran. We're now almost a year into that deal. Should Israelis be able to sleep uh, uh, quietly and, and feel safe, uh, safer today than we were before the deal was reached? I am very, have been always very much concerned about the possibility that Iran would go nuclear. I think that would be a disastrous outcome. Against that backdrop, let me say that I have welcomed the agreement that was made with Iran. Not that it guarantees they'll never get nuclear weapons, but it certainly decreases the probability, and it also increases the support within Iran for those leaders who did not want nuclear weapons, who believed they were a danger, who were willing to look into a reach an accommodation with the West. So for all of those reasons, I think it was a good agreement, not just for the United States, I think it was a good agreement for Israel as well. I realize many leaders in Israel do not agree with that, but I think it was a good agreement for Israel. Former Defense Minister Perry, thank you much, so much for being with us at ILTV. Thank you. It's good to talk with you. And now a warm welcome to esteemed Rabbi Dov Lipman, who will guide us through this week's Torah portion. So what is the meaning of this week's parsha? So there are many different topics actually in the parsha, but I think there are two that have specific lessons that relate to us today, and especially uh, in Israel. There's one story, uh, you know, the holiday of Passover is celebrated on the 15th of the Hebrew month of Nisan, and all the preparations and the sacrifices take place on the 14th, the day before. And there were a number of people, the first time the Jews were celebrating this holiday in the desert on their way from Egypt to Israel, 
that were impure. They were impure for various reasons and they couldn't celebrate the holiday. And they were impure. That happens. They couldn't do it. But they were so frustrated that they couldn't be part of the holiday. They came to Moses and they complained. And they said, why should we be left out? We want to celebrate as well. And Moses uh, turns to God and God says, you know what? They want this so badly, there'll be a second chance. And a month later, on the 14th of Iyar, they have the opportunity to celebrate Pesach. It's called Pesach Sheni, the second Passover in Hebrew, which is an amazing concept. It didn't exist before they complained. They, they demanded the opportunity to celebrate, and God gave them that opportunity. And the commentaries point out the lesson that especially when it comes to spiritual things, very often we think there's a, a wall in front of us. There's no way I could possibly do this or that or be spiritual. Uh, if a person wants it badly enough, then doors can open in front of them. And that's actually part of the lesson of the state of Israel. There was a wall in front of these people who were Zionists and wanted to create a state. But they wanted it so badly that all of a sudden things that one can never imagine, the UN voting for a partition plan in 1947, things that you can in a six-day war, when you want something badly spiritually, it can happen. That's one of the lessons in this week's portion. So how is this story and this meaning applicable to today? What is it so, so I think when we in Israel today look at our situation, a fragmented nation, right? There's religious and there's secular, there's ultra-Orthodox issues about reform and conservative. All these issues are burning internally in Israel. We have issues between Jews and non-Jews in Israel. We have issues with our external enemies. And sometimes a person can say, it's, there's no hope, there's no chance. We can't possibly uh, manage these situations. I think the lesson from this week's Torah portion is if we want to badly enough, right? If you will it, it's no dream. That's really the message. We have to be persistent. It might take a hundred years until uh, we resolve some of these issues. But we have to always keep our mind on the goal and always hope for the best and always work on it and eventually we'll get there. Is there another message that you think this Pelsha sends to us? There's actually another very powerful message, which is the flip side of what we just talked about. And that is, the Jews are going through the desert, they're on their way to Israel, they're getting ready to enter their land, everything's going wonderful, and the people just start complaining. And some of the commentaries say they didn't have much to complain about. All their needs are being taken care of by God in the desert, but it's human nature to just complain and to focus on any little negative in life. And as a result of that, things actually start to fall apart and that generation actually doesn't enter the land of Israel and they end up in the desert for another 40 years and everything goes downhill. And the message from that is when we see negativity, when there are things to complain about, don't complain about them. Roll up your sleeves, get involved and try to fix them. But just sitting back and complaining gets no one anywhere and actually leads to uh, maximizing the problem instead of actually solving the problem. And therefore, we should take these two lessons together. On the one hand, when something goes wrong, don't complain. Put your eyes towards a solution, believe that you can do it, and then the sky is the limit in terms of what we can accomplish. Well, I should take that advice to heart. Thank you so much for coming in. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, everybody, that's it for today's show. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. And don't forget to check out our morning update on Sunday at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Thanks for watching and Shabbat Shalom.